Hello and welcome to this guideline update looking at the recent UK Kidney Association guidelines, 2023 guidelines looking at SGLT2 inhibitor use in CKD. Now there's been a lot of changes, a lot of development in evidence base with regards to SGLT2 use in CKD from way back looking at the canagliflozin and credence through to dapagliflozin and dapa CKD, but also now more recently empagliflozin and the empa kidney trial. So again there's been a lot of uh, evidence to amalgamate and put into a guideline and um, really this is kind of where this UK Kidney Association guideline comes in and we're fortunate to have Patrick Holmes here who was also part of the guideline writing committee and really my first kind of thought about this is why exactly do we need this guideline now at this time? It's a really good question as you said you mentioned all those trials you've mentioned um, uh, various different guidelines they said there's nice guidance out there already um, but this is a rapidly moving field um, I think the if you're trying to follow the nice guidance, it's very confusing uh, because you've got you've got to look at the type 2 you've got to look at the CKD and then you've got to look at the individual uh, molecules particularly if you're using outside of type 2 diabetes such as dapagliflozin and empagliflozin so very confusing I cannot see any jobbing clinician who's busy having enough time for that or being able to have a life maybe that's where we we fit in uh, we don't have the life so other people can live it but but no in, in all seriousness so whereas the uk kidney association is nicely updated all of this in one simple guideline um, they uh, and they've done a really good job i mean i know i was part of it so i'm a bit biased in that but i i've, I've watched i'm just one of the gps the two gps were involved in it um, but it's it's a really useful guide um, and, and, and before we go into the, some of the detail, I think it's important for people to know it's a resource if they want patient information leaflets, both for type 2 diabetes and uh, people who don't have type 2 diabetes in terms of uh, uh, this. It might be a useful guide you want to um, share with your nephrologists if you're wanting specific advice or referencing um, if, um, if you've got people in, in certain subgroups. But it, I think perhaps we, you know, we should look at what's the meat of of, of what's this new guidance. I suppose before I even say that, I think there's some more stuff. So CKD is a, such a common condition. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're looking at between uh, nine and uh, uh, 10 million people in the UK. So, and, and, and probably about 40% of those people aren't actually diagnosed. So we often talk in type one diabetes of um, the missing million. With chronic kidney disease in the UK, we're talking about the missing four million. Okay, so that's an important issue, uh, which we, we certainly need to be thinking about, and, and the guideline hopefully will help us to manage it. We've still got to find them. So, so that's, uh, and, and people with chronic kidney disease are at much higher risk of cardiovascular disease, hospitalization. Um, so it, it's, it's it, it, and so we, there are things, this is a high risk group, which we need to be managing differently from the lower risk group. So, um, and it's not just in terms of preventing kidney decline and dialysis, that's important, but it's also about preventing them dying or early or, or, or having to go into hospital um, uh, uh, multiple times. I think that's that's a key thing what you mentioned. It was you mentioned type one it's type two diabetes, I think the unmet million. <laughs> Just yeah, oh no, yeah, yeah. no worries. We, we we know what we're talking about. Sure. Uh, but um, I think that's what the key thing about this guideline actually it, 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 it looks across a number of different it looks across yeah, type type two diabetes, type one diabetes comorbidities, heart failure, mm. um, and CKD as well, as individual entities, but also together as well. And I think that's quite nice because it looks across a different spectrum and it highlights the kind of the multidisciplinary nature of CKD management. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, the guideline committee is also composed of all those members. I think that's very good for a guideline mm. to have that breadth of representation across specialties, especially in the current age of, um, you know, joint, I guess, multimorbidity working, especially yep. in, in the setting of, of diabetes. Um, but perhaps I can pinpoint you or pin you down on some of the specifics of this guidance. Maybe, maybe the, the new things or something that, that was relevant to you. What's the kind of key thing, the key message, the key find, the key um, thing you want to disseminate from this guideline or the learning point from it? So I think, um, I think it's really important that we highlight the quick reference guide within it because I think that's really easy. So we will that will pop up probably, and we'll put a, a reference so you can actually for future. So I, this is something which will be worth not only being aware of but being able to access within clinic because some of the numbers I don't know about you I can forget the exact details, but so but the big big num big things here is the EGFR for initiating SGLT two inhibitors now has dropped from twenty five to twenty as a firm recommendation based on the epikidney mm -hmm. data. Yeah, that's right. And then we, we're suddenly opening up the uh, use of SGLT2 inhibitors uh, where their urinary ACR is actually 
fairly low or normal um, um, if their EGFR is in the 20 to 45 range, okay, uh, whether they've got type 2 diabetes or they don't. That is a group of people who would benefit for kidney protection um, in terms of kidney progression, um, which is new. So that's new and it's highlighted um, nicely in that quick reference guide. Um, there is always some controversial bits within the, um, uh, the guideline. There is a suggestion that it can be used for type 1 diabetes. Much higher risk of, of adverse effects with SGLT2 inhibitors. Definitely one you need to involve specialists involved. It's definitely not a GP initiating thing, this one. But, but the, and there is a, um, a suggestion of using it actually with EGFRs below 20. Again, get that nephrologist involved. I don't think just do it on your own. Um, but, but there, so I think it's, it's and, and there is this firm recommendation if people have got comorbidity of heart failure, they, they're really going to benefit with, this is potentially a, a group of people are going to benefit enormously. So I think that quick reference guide, but remember there's a massive guideline behind it which has got lots of information. Even if you're having trouble, I don't know, managing um, uh, uh, recurrent thrush, It'll tell you in that guideline how to do so. So, so it, it, it is a, it is a, a rich resource um, uh, written in a way which is accessible to public and, and to HCPs, be it specialists or non-specialists. No, I, I agree with that. I've seen a few things on this that, that I particularly wanted to highlight. I think one of them was, um, you mentioned it actually, about type 1 diabetes. They, they, they've probably gone a bit further than most guide, other guidelines mm. before them in suggesting, uh, suggesting consider it in those with type 1 diabetes yep. and I think this this boils back down to the whole unmet need in those with type 1 diabetes about their cardiorenal risk. Um, we talked about lots in type 2 diabetes and in those with you know, heart failure, heart disease or CKD but not in type 1 specifically and and, and there is an unmet need, there's a, there's a large unmet need there and, and it's going to increase even more so. Um, we have kind of I guess risk stratification tools like those from Steno looking at you know, risk of these complications with type 1 and potentially the benefits of, of using SGLT2 inhibitors but this guideline suggests actually considering it. I think that that's heartening however as you mentioned speak to a nephrologist, speak to an endocrinologist about that I think that, that could be, should be sort of specialist initiation or specialist consideration yeah. I think. Um, the other thing is also it, it does talk about it in different um, GFR thresholds as well yeah. and certainly the less than 20 was quite interesting because again that's mm -hmm. Kind of extrapolated data, but we've seen it across all the molecules, the SGLT2 molecules essentially that we use, um, that there is evidence of using it down to dialysis as well. So yep. again, there's extrapolation, but again, it, it, it's a kind of an understandable, you know, extrapolation and, and, and consideration of evidence. And, and obviously, the, the lower the EGFR, you, you, you know, you're not going to prolong maybe people's um, kidney function for many, many years, but you might do for. A couple of years, and that might make, make a huge deal of difference to the person who's in front of you. So, yeah, it's it's almost never too never, and never yeah. too late. And I think that's that, that comes onto the other side of this guide, as I found interesting. They looked at specific groups within, um, kind of you might consider this in, and also you know risk groups, but also groups might benefit. So, for example, they used to look at frailty and do comment on frailty. And I think that's the balance in in, in any case is looking at. You could intervene, and, and you know, by definition, people with frailty and multimorbidity have large number of these conditions. They may have heart failure, they may have type 2 diabetes, they may have CKD, and they may benefit most from these medic medications. But balancing that with the quality of life is also something to consider. But also, if you start these medications earlier on in individuals, perhaps you can prevent a lot of these complications. So it's it's balancing all that together, and I think these guidelines do suggest towards that and considering that. They mentioned about DKA risk, they mentioned about the risk of uh, sick day rules and, 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 and complications in, in, in renal in, you know, impairment, AKI, that side of things. They talk about um, UTIs and thrush as well and all the other rarer complications. So again, very pragmatic, very, very kind of broad in terms of what they suggest. And I think that's what I found, I guess, quite useful and unique about these guidelines. It, it's, it's all there. It's all there in one, one simple use yeah. guideline. I think that's something that... Um, is worth him disseminating to the to, to, to most yeah. practitioners. And a uh, slight conflict of interest in terms of some of the evidence there. Um, the Ember Kidney study you talked about, the Ember study, Will Harrington was one of the uh, chief authors of that, and he's on the guideline committee. But he, he and it, but it was an honor to work alongside such a clever bloke. He's a nephrologist mm -hmm. down in, in in Oxford. And and you know, and yeah, so I think from a primary care perspective, there's a huge amount of work to be done, both in uh, diagnosing, coding, 
never mind treating and, uh, and up titrating the traditional agents if they've got uh, of, of ACE inhibitors or ALBS as well. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, but but um, uh, and, and other drugs like phenenerone, actually, if they've got type 2 diabetes, of course, need to be considered too. So it's uh, maybe even GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists if we want to go the whole hog. But 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 it, it's um, uh, it, but but it. But let's start it simple. This, the, this, the SGLT2 inhibitors is, is arguably the simplest bit of this. And this guideline, if you go to this guideline, you don't need to go to any other guideline. Yeah. Certainly not in 2023. Um, so, uh, so I think it's a really useful tool. And as I said, the quick reference guide, I cannot encourage you enough to look at it if you just want to, a nice, simple, easy life and to understand uh, what, um, what you need to be doing with your patient in front of you without sort of spending uh, minutes or hours, uh, which we don't have, to look uh, for this information. So there we have it. We've got the use of estrogen inhibitors across a spectrum of CKD based on the strengthening of evidence across most ranges of, 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 of CKD, really, and, and, and the utilization of it. So do check out these guidelines. Do follow us for further updates and, and details, and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you.